Welcome back to the channel. I want to talk about how Ron DeSantis handled the COVID-19 pandemic. Ron DeSantis has entered the presidential primary, and this is the talk of the town. How did DeSantis do? How did Cuomo do? How did all these state governors do? How did Gavin do? And I want to give you my thoughts on this issue. How Ron DeSantis fared in the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's run through the topics. We're going to talk about lockdowns. We're going to talk about schools. We'll talk about vaccines, mandates, natural immunity, and maybe even some of the outcomes data, how the excess mortality compares between states and what that might mean. Let's talk about what people are talking about. So I will just say right off the bat, I'm going to make the claim that of all the governors in this country, of perhaps all the political leaders globally, Ron DeSantis is near the top. He handled it as well as it could have been handled. His handling of the COVID-19 pandemic was superb. Let me go through the different domains and explain how he got things right that other people didn't. Okay, let's start with lockdowns. We all remember 15 days to flatten the curve. Of course, it turned into, for some people, three years ongoing. They're still trying to flatten the curve. I don't know what they're hoping to accomplish. But it was much longer than the promised 15 days. Governor Ron DeSantis, I think like almost everybody in this country, initially did take the actions that all the other people were taking. And I don't fault him for that. I think it would have been very unusual for him not to have taken those actions initially because there was incredible uncertainty. We had just found out from the WHO that the case fatality rate was 3.4, 3.8%, which would have been catastrophic if that turned out to be the actual IFR, which of course, it's not even close to the actual IFR. There are a number of biases that suggested it was heavily inflated because people weren't being tested routinely. But yet with that specter, with the Imperial College London report, with the fact that the president was pushing for lockdowns, I think I forgive him for that initial lockdown choice, although I think in retrospect, it was a blunder. But very quickly, while many other governors continued to deepen or enforce lockdowns or entrench lockdowns or close public spaces, Ron DeSantis, I think, very quickly figured out that this was not going to be a durable long-term strategy. It lacked pre-pandemic guidance. He probably had more of an opportunity to familiarize himself with the pre-pandemic literature. He drew upon, I think, very wise guidance from Jay Bhattacharya, from Martin Kulsdorf, from others who had been writing op-eds in the Wall Street Journal and other places. And so I think by the end of March, April, Ron DeSantis already started to have a different perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic, a much more rational, a much more public health perspective. By public health, I mean a traditional public health perspective, not a totalitarian uh, police state public health perspective, which dominates the uh, dominates the, the field these days. He had a more traditional public health should empower people, but it shouldn't use the police state to restrict them sort of view. And very quickly, I think by the spring of 2020, he relaxed a number of restrictions so that Florida was pretty free. I know many people, including professors, who rented homes in Florida and lived there during those months because it was as normal as it could be. He relied on the fact that people would always make voluntary behavioral decisions different based on going case rates and based on their fear of the virus. But you didn't need to have draconian mandates on top of that. And the benefit of those mandates beyond what people are voluntarily choosing to do is absolutely uncertain. And there's a price. You're taking away people's freedom. So we're going to talk about how you judge someone's pandemic response. Let's talk about schools. Ron DeSantis very quickly, I think, came to the correct policy conclusion about schools, which is schools must be open. Schools provide a vital safety net. They're the last tattered rung of the ladder of opportunity left in America. And he reopened those schools. And no matter how you feel about any of his other policy decisions, just this school's decision for the Florida kids, for the children in Florida, might have so much positive economic and health outcomes for these children to go back to school that it will blow away any other state government decision, perhaps from throughout the whole pandemic. I mean, it was just such a tremendous good. When I talk about this online, people always say, I get the economic side. How does the economic side impact their life expectancy? And the answer is there's a deep uh, literature in the field of public health that improving people's socioeconomic fates actually improves their physical well-being. They make better healthcare choices. They're more empowered to seek health care when they're feeling unwell. They live longer. They live better lives. It's not just giving them money in their pocket. So by having schools, this huge ladder of opportunity available, Ron DeSantis actually has very likely improve the life expectancy of the children in that state. And that is a tremendous good and a truly courageous act because people were not, did not want to do that. And you have to think what he went up against, actually. I think it's very important. He went up against the CDC, the teachers unions, Anthony Fauci, the media, the entire media was on him for this. And yet he stood fast and he kept those schools open. And I think the children of Florida and we all owe him a debt of gratitude. 
He makes a good point. By removing lockdowns and keeping schools open, he actually gave other people the idea that you could do this too. So I give him that too. He's right. Absolutely he's right. He gave other states the, the space to push back on some of these policies. And I think these policies were in error. And I say that as somebody who is on the progressive side of the political spectrum. This is not how public health was ever intended to be. It was an abuse of power. And the deepest abuse, the the deepest uh, factor that I think that contributed to the abuse of power was having people in charge like Fauci, like Bricks, who are not very good at having a diverse group of people around them and having some people to push back on them. I run a very small research laboratory not the scale of the federal government, but even our laboratory with 20, 30 people, I always like to have a few people who will argue with me about everything we're doing because the more they argue with me, the better the product becomes because we anticipate objections. Sometimes I refine my thinking. Sometimes I admit uh, maybe I was wrong. Sometimes they're wrong, but I have to persuade them why they're wrong and then I can reformulate the language. I think Fauci, Bricks, Trump would have benefited greatly from having not just Scott Atlas, who I thought was probably the sanest voice at the table there, but also some other people on the panel and a broader community. But as we know from FOIA documents that Fauci and Collins and others worked steadfastly to suppress the voices of anybody in science who felt otherwise, who felt that draconian lockdowns were not the answer. Let's talk about schools and masks. Ron DeSantis made a very bold policy choice, which he actually said, not only is there not going to be a Florida state-level mask mandate for kids in schools, you're not allowed to mandate it in your district. I'm going to stop you from mandating it in your district. And I heard him on a libertarian podcast where he was pressed on that. Why are you prohibiting? He prohibited also businesses from having their own mask mandates. Why are you prohibiting people from choosing to have a mask mandate if they so wish? He made a number of excellent points. One of which is by taking away the mask mandate in schools in Florida, you can see how many parents really wanted to send their kids to school with a mask. And the answer is very low. Most parents didn't want to do that. So it wasn't really a choice people were voluntarily making. That's one. Two, the evidence. The evidence for masking kids. Any type of mask. I'm not even saying, first of all, let's put it aside. The cloth mask has absolutely piss poor evidence. It does not work. It's never worked. It had no evidence that it worked. Suggesting it in the absence of randomized studies, at least ongoing, was a total fool's errand. Put that aside. And that's the fact, that's the mask that most children wore throughout the whole pandemic. So that was a total fiasco. But even the evidence to support a child wearing a surgical mask or an N95 or one of these stupid respirators that these companies have built for children, there is no good evidence to support this. I struggle to understand how anyone who has studied medicine, public health, and behavioral interventions for public health could be so stupid as to think that that would be an effective policy. You have to understand the compliance in even healthcare settings, tightly controlled healthcare settings, is piss poor. When you start to extrapolate this to young children, you're going to get compliance so bad, cheating so high, you won't be able to sustain any potential benefit of the intervention. It's a fool's errand. Pairing it to two naked political par- politics, I think, was bad. I think what Ron DeSantis did was actually quite clever. By preventing the local municipalities from having their own mask mandate, he, one of his arguments is that they were under a delusion. They were just caught up in the media narrative around masking, which was one-sided, monolithic, driven by faith-based reasoning and not evidence. They were caught up in that sort of Fauciism, he calls it, and I think he's probably accurate. They were caught in that, and so he wanted to prevent them from succumbing to their own delusions, which is actually, ironically, sort of a progressive policy position on the on the regulatory state, that one of the virtues of the regulatory state is to prevent people from making stupid decisions. In this case, Ron DeSantis was right about what was stupid. Masking children was stupid, and he prevented the local municipality from succumbing to a stupid policy decision. So I actually commend him for that. I actually think that was actually very good of him. Very good. Let's talk about vaccines. I've heard a lot of people say that he was against vaccinating everybody, all people. I don't see any evidence of that, and if anyone disagrees with me, put it in the comments. I see somebody who did advocate for voluntary vaccination of older people who hadn't had COVID. That's what I see from when I've read him and followed him in interviews. And also acknowledged that we don't have great evidence for children. We don't have great evidence for young adults. We don't have great evidence for people who have already had COVID and recovered and that there are known harms such as myocarditis. Maybe you want to have a softer stance on young adults. I think that was reflected in a lot of the writing of Ladapo. One of the papers that Ladapo got a lot of pushback on was whether or not Vaccinating a 20-year-old man will increase their short-term risk of cardiac death. We know for sure it increases myocarditis. It is plausible and intuitive that when you increase a rare adverse event that has sort of a stochastic distribution of outcomes, you will increase those tail risk events as well, and there might be this signal. He was lambasted for this 
paper, which probably was quite on the mark, at least philosophically and perhaps even numerically, but it has since been confirmed, I think, broadly by a, a study from Europe, which basically finds a very similar result of a short-term increase in adverse cardiovac cardiovascular outcomes beyond myocarditis, which would be expected and natural. Allowing a Surgeon General to have that dialogue in your state against the forces of the national movement and against sort of an irrational anti-anti-vax movement, a group of people that's irrationally pro-vaccine in all cases without considering that the risk-benefit profile may vary by product and by dose and by timing and in populations and may be different for the second dose of Moderna on day 28 than it is for, you know, something else, right? So it's sort of a uh, any, any sort of nuanced view here was sort of bulldozed by this anti-anti-vax movement of crazy people. Ron DeSantis made space for having a more rational discussion. Finally, he was opposed to mandating the vaccine, which I think is an incredibly important policy choice. Mandating a vaccine, you cannot mandate anything for anybody that, let me put it this way. What is a prerequisite to mandate for something to somebody? If you think you have something that makes me better off, and you may even have strong evidence that makes me better off, like I should control my blood pressure. I probably should. I'm 40 years old. I should control my blood pressure. But you can't force me to take the blood pressure pills because even if I don't want to control my blood pressure, that's my choice. And if I take the blood pressure pills and I start to feel like maybe it's making me depressed or I complain about something else, it's not your business to tell me I should keep swallowing those tablets. In medicine, we've had a long-standing principle. You cannot mandate something on somebody merely because it's in their own interest. That's not sufficient to mandate a health medical intervention and take away their autonomy. I'm allowed to make bad healthcare choices. That's called the grocery store, actually, all the middle aisles. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm allowed to. You might have a case to mandate something. You might, not that you have to, but you might have a case if the intervention on me will benefit third parties, and you know that to be true with some confidence, then you might have a case. Even in that situation, you have to weigh the potential benefits and unanticipated adverse events and unanticipated secondary political consequences from the, uh, uh, you have to weigh those two things together. I believed that even if you thought it had a benefit on third parties, it probably wasn't wise to do it because of the political climate we're living in, because of the fact it was so new. But you didn't even need to get there. It did not have a benefit to third parties. It never had proven a benefit to third parties. There was never that ethical prerequisite to mandate it to third parties. I think Ron DeSantis understood that very deeply, and he prevented uh, mandates uh, from workplaces. He even said that he prevented large corporations from enforcing those mandates in a state, which again, I think was very good policy, which actually kept people in work, et cetera. Natural immunity, I think, he was good about that. He acknowledged that that was a protective factor. Now let's talk about outcomes. You know, people are going to say things like, oh, let's compare New York mortality and Florida mortality. And look, there's many ways we can slice and dice this data. You can either look in just 2020. You can look at 2020, 2021, 22, 23. You can look at deaths from COVID. You can look at excess mortality, deaths beyond what would have been expected. That's observed minus expected deaths, where expected deaths is a modeled value. It's not a value that Moses gave us from the mountain. It's a value that we have imputed, and that value may be incorrect. You can look at this. And COVID-19 deaths can be incorrect because of both the label being attached to deaths with COVID, not from COVID, and also somebody dying of COVID who wasn't tested for COVID. There can be both types of errors. These are all sort of imperfect metrics. The metric I think that makes the most sense is probably expected mortality. The other thing to understand is that if you took the country and you just chopped it up into 50 quadrants and those quadrants did not fall along state lines, you will see some distribution of outcomes in these quadrants by chance alone. So there's going to be some chance variation when you compare states. You have to ask, is the variation you're seeing beyond chance variation? The next piece of the puzzle when you start to compare states is to say, well, guess what? Florida has a lot of older people. So you have to adjust for the population pyramid of the state, the population characteristics. Florida has people with maybe more comorbidities. They retired there because... You know, it's nicer to be in a warmer climate. You have to adjust for those factors. To me, what's most remarkable is when you adjust for age and or comorbidities and look at excess mortality across states and pick a reasonable time window where you're capturing both the effects of the pandemic and the effects of the interventions on the pandemic. It's pretty clear to me that Florida actually does pretty well. Uh, Sweden does very well. Okay, Florida does pretty well. And there's no, and I, I would be even more broad and say that, you know, the real takeaway is that a lot of places do roughly similar. A lot of places ended up in a very similar place with very disparate policy. And so with that in mind, that the the pandemic's impact has been, I would say, more remarkable than anything. It's been how similar it's been rather than how different it's been between states. Of course, the places it's been worse in Mississippi, places with a lot of obesity, a lot of underlying medical conditions, a lot of poverty, that's to be expected. But adjust for poverty, adjust for age, adjust, adjust for underlying medical conditions, and it's actually kind of similar. What does that tell us? 
it tells us that our policies didn't do that much. They were very superficial. And if that's the case, the person who did the best in the pandemic is the person who, all things being equal, let's say that outcomes are broadly equal, who prevented the most irrational actions. Ron DeSantis wins. He prevented uh, these zealots from masking kids against the will of the parents, against the will of the kids, who prevented the most number of people from being fired for not taking a vaccine even if they had to recover from COVID. So Ron DeSantis wins there. Who gave people the most freedom to live their lives as they see fit. Ron DeSantis wins. Who gave people the most days of school. Ron DeSantis wins by, by a yard. So if you acknowledge that the differences between states are slight, and I think that really is the case, the more you sort of adjust for these important covariates, then the person who had the lightest touch and the most careful touch did the best. And so I think probably I'll put him top five governors, top three even, during the entire COVID-19 pandemic, maybe in the top 15 or 20 political leaders across the globe. He did a very good job. Uh, and he deserves all the credit for that. And so there's no doubt about it. Cuomo was a total fiasco. He, he had many, many failed policies. Um, he took away people's freedoms and he didn't do a whole lot better. In fact, by some metrics, he even did a little bit worse, but I think more or less they're broadly comparable. Uh, he did terrible job. I would say one of the worst. Um, Gavin Newsom, unfortunately, one of the worst jobs imaginable. Didn't go up against unions, kept schools closed way too long, unnecessary vaccine mandates, unnecessary mask mandates, total fiasco. So how did Ron DeSantis do on COVID-19? Ron DeSantis did brilliantly on COVID-19. More than anything, the thing it tells me about him is that when the world is screaming at him to do something, he turned to his own intuition, his own gut, he sought his own advice, and he actually ended up doing the right thing. And that to me, no matter what you feel about any other issue, that to me matters in politics, it matters a great deal. So those are my thoughts on this issue. You know what to do if you like it. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.